From the Samuelli Institute headquarters in Alexandria, Virginia, this is On Human Flourishing. Today we're happy to welcome Jonathan Peck to the table for a conversation on health care of the future. Mr. Peck is the president and senior futurist at the Institute for Alternative Futures. His expertise spans scientific, economic, political, and social change. And he's consulted for corporations, foundations, and government agencies assisting them in their future plan. Just before this podcast, we were discussing forecasting and some of the forecasts that you've made over the, the decades that uh, have come true and others that have come true. And I wondered if you'd tell us a little bit about, um, about futuring and about futures work and kind of what is it, and, mm-hmm. uh, and then maybe get into how you've uh, been applying it in healthcare, a hot topic uh, even now. Sure, I'd love to. Thank you, Wayne. So futures... Uh, most people think is about predicting the future, and certainly, you know, people we do prediction all the time. I think all humans predict. It's part of how we think. Um, what we do is recognize that prediction's not the value proposition. The uh, ability to think out into futures and see what's likely and what's preferred enables us to act in a way that we can bias towards the futures that we would most want to create and shape. So it's a way of informing decision makers and actors saying after thinking through the future possibilities and likelihoods and then what we would really prefer, here are steps we can take now that are more likely to lead us to a future we'd want to live in rather than one we're afraid we might have to live. So um, a lot of questions about that, but how is this different than, uh, before we get into healthcare, how is this different than uh, strategic planning, for example? Oh, that's such a good question. And it took me years to figure out the answer. Uh, Strategic planning uh, is based on assumptions that are drawn from the past into the present and generally somewhat into the future, but rarely in a serious way, certainly not beyond five to 10. This is usually the maximum horizon of strategic planning. So there's a kind of conventional limit that goes because you're assuming that the problems you face, the solutions you came up with, your uses of resources are going to be those that succeeded in the past. So futures, by contrast, will create an a complementary logic that makes your premise that here is a future that is possible and preferable and then you draw inferences back towards the present which lead you to say well if we start this in the present it actually may create a uh, a pathway if you will of greater likelihood to getting to the futures that we're interested in and you will typically have charted out futures that you are concerned about or don't want or afraid of. Uh, so the ability to sort of navigate a probability space defined not solely by your experience from the past, which is what usually strategic planning is constrained by, mm-hmm. uh, but to actually open the aperture to say, well, here is what we can see is likely or preferred uh, that could change. So futures is inherently more sensitive to the changes that are coming in the larger environment. Strategic planning is more sensitive to the resource allocation within an organization. I see. So in some ways, futuring provides a much bigger box to play in, both Mm -hmm. in terms of the distance that you can go out. You go out more than 10 years in, in many cases. Uh, but also doesn't resource necessarily get your thinking resource constrained around what you currently have. So, um, so you said something that was very curious, though, around this. And I know I'm avoiding health. I'm not avoiding health care, <laughs> but we haven't gotten to health care. We yet. always will get and to health care. Uh, but um, uh, you said something very interesting about this uh, a process, uh, which is that you could guide than uh, the probabilities to go more towards that future. So is, is this about discovery or is it about, uh, is it about creation? I mean, what are you doing here with future? I love that question too. I, I would say that it is both and. 
So uh, to the extent that we bring futures to decision making and it guides resource allocation and investment in something new, uh, I see it as very much uh, tied into uh, the decision making that says we're going to create a bias towards the futures that we could see as both possible and desirable. To the extent that our job before coming to a decision making process is to really explore its discovery. So it's getting outside the boundaries. And uh, I, I couldn't help but think when you said it's a bigger box, uh, I think all through my career since becoming a futurist, I have heard this is out of the box thinking. Mm -hmm. And I started to consider, well, what is this box constructed of? And I concluded that it's the untested assumptions that say this is reality and beyond that is not reality. Well, because the future doesn't exist yet, you're immediately less constrained by your view of reality. And psychologists tell us that each of us walks around with a feeling that we have a slightly privileged view of reality. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you're a smart guy, but somehow my view of reality must be a little more right than you. Mm -hmm. Comes along with having a healthy ego. Uh, <laughs> what we'd like to know is can we expand the recognition and can we, particularly by combining your great intellect and the points of view I've developed, start to see emerging a future that is a higher possibility than either of us could see alone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think the, the creation part of it uh, then is part of that because setting intentions is a very important part of creation. Uh, you know, as psychologists uh, have documented a number of times, you see what you expect to see. <laughs> That's right. And so in a sense, it sounds like you're creating uh, more explicit expectations about what we could see and therefore make it more probable that we would see that. Is that, is that correct? Yes, and it's very well put. Uh, I would add, because you and I have had experience together in doing this, you're well versed in the method that we call aspirational futures, right. that we recognizably create what people expect to see in the future as one image, uh, an expectable future, uh, and we've done that in healthcare uh, in multiple iterations, including the uh, health and healthcare 2032 scenarios that you and I worked with, uh, as well as the primary care scenarios for 2045. And that expectable future is methodologically vital. Uh, and we know we have it right when we do a survey and ask people what they think is most likely, and they identify that as the scenario with the highest likelihood. What we want to set uh, against that is both the futures that uh, you, you find more fearful, uh, where you imagine we mess it up. In healthcare, that's easy to imagine. Um, and then those futures where we're surprised by how successful it could be. And if we have that really well articulated, it creates a real tension between, here's the future I expect. I think that's likely we're going to just get that future. And here's a future that I really want because it's so much better. Mm -hmm. And so it's that tension between the more visionary image that says, if you were as great as you could be, and you were a fabulous leader in bringing people through where we've been, and where we are, into surprisingly successful futures, and here's what it would look at like, then it calls on you to say, you know, if that's possible, I ought to do everything I can to make it more likely and then commit to action. And so we've seen that, for example, with uh, Culture of Health, which was the aspirational future scenario for 2032 that you and I worked on in Kansas City uh, a few years ago that ultimately has shaped the vision for Robert Wood Johnson Foundation for health and health care and has certainly been influential with you and me as we've gone to form a uh, creating a well-being leadership group.
to bring about the culture change that we can see is, is possible. It's so much better. Well, when the first time I did this with you, I thought, what the heck are they doing? You know, they're just throwing all these things out. And I remember one of your first uh, um, healthcare focused futures long time ago, I think it was called uh, 2019 Healthcare That Works for All. <laughs> and, yes. uh, uh, and now we see actually many of those things coming to pass. Uh, uh, I think in, in, in many ways because of some of the visions that were, were laid out in that, uh, in that meeting. Um, what do you see really as uh, sort of the direction for fu future in terms of healthcare? I mean, where are we going? I mean, you've finished uh, now the, the uh, report for Robert Wood Johnson that you talked about. Uh, now it's uh, the idea of a culture of health is starting to become a mainstream part of the conversation when it was one of the aspirational components in that meeting, as I recall. Uh, where are we going? I mean, um, um, what what is the future of healthcare, and how, how do what are some of the major influences that you see in those areas? Well, I would say the major direction is a kind of right sizing of healthcare. Um, <clears throat> it's been the fastest growing part of our economy for for some time, and it has contributed in many ways to some of the disturbances in, in our potential, uh, that to the extent that we spend too much uh, on um, really too marginal a way of improving people's lives, uh, it takes away from our potential to spend more smartly on getting what we truly want. Um, so for example, the focus on disease that healthcare has had uh, has us spending too much on what we don't want and spending too little on enabling the health of every infant that, that is born in this country, on giving them the best possible start to life, which oftentimes has very little to do with anything medical and everything to do with what kind of environment are we placing them in? Are they getting the the love and, and security that is needed at the very beginning of life as the limbic system grows. We know the spiritual intelligences of love and faith and joy and awe are really what are formed there in, in the exchange between an adult and an infant, except for when it isn't. And we're placing way too many infants in environments where they're not given those basics that set them on the life course where they can be healthy, thriving, flourishing uh, people. And, and so our neglect there, uh, which is really evident in, for example, the proportion of children born into poverty, which has been going up since the late 60s as we shifted with healthcare dollars to spend more on the end of life on, you know, through Medicare since the mid-60s. Uh, you know, I can get all kinds of free medical care, uh, but we're not spending adequately at the beginning of life. Yeah. So the so the physical and social environment is so important to sort of set up the foundation and drive people uh, towards flourishing. That uh, that these are where you, you see we need to have the, the future investment needs to be shifted more yeah. into those areas. Yeah. I just know as you go through your examination of healthcare and have you know a number of times uh, over your futuring career and work, um, lots of things are thrown out as as influencers from technology to leadership to um, disaster events to uh, to uh, you know investment in infrastructure. Um, what are the major drivers do you see now as uh, moving forward? I mean, what's going to transform? Um, our medical uh, care um, into a true health or health creation uh, uh, culture. Uh, what are the major drivers you see? Where are the handles? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I actually have come to see it as a, a rather large-scale value shift um, that uh, doesn't come to all at once and yet it has this powerful momentum and it's an upshifting and it creates a new ethical uh, awareness in terms of our responsibility 
to each other, to life on the planet, to uh, futures informing what we do. And I think this is something that um, the United States has a, an interesting lag time in uh, compared to, say, Northern Europe. Uh, so you can oftentimes see the pattern more fully developed abroad than you can here in the U.S. <clears throat> but some of the evidence of it actually comes from psychology. And so we know that psychologically, uh, we all develop through stages. And there's an oscillation um, in stages from a, a more me-centered edge to a more we-centered edge. And so I think the major shift of our time that will uh, challenge healthcare to go through the transition is from a, a more me-centered, I call it a competitive me ethic, where uh, I win by being very strategic and getting the nice car, the nice house, my kids into the best universities. And that achievement reaches a point where it's not enough and in the face of a society that's not flourishing, it becomes actually something that simply doesn't satisfy the ethical need I have to make a contribution, to find a meaningful path in my life so that I can die feeling like the meaning of my life uh, is fulfilling. So the, so the, the, the future of healthcare you see going less uh, uh, emphasis on my health than our health well said. in these areas. Well yeah. said. If you could sort of do your next futuring scenario, your next uh, futuring meeting, who, who would you want to have in the room? Oh, that's a wonderful question. Um, I would really want to bring in, in fact, I actually am working on this. Are you? So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so we, we have um, uh, a proposal that's out that's looking at kind of wisdom on earth. So could we bring <clears throat> uh, some of the wisest from multiple cultures to kind of create something of a guidance system and then connect them in with the young leaders who can envision uh, what their work will lead to and create a dialogue that's both intergenerational uh, and one that is enabled a distribution. So my presumption is that we've all lived through an information revolution. The last few decades, uh, we all have plenty of information. Um, and they used to say information is power, and I think it's really a very limited form of power. Uh, information is any difference that makes a difference, but we're overwhelmed with the differences of seven billion people on a planet with technology interconnecting us. And we, we saw this challenge actually working with scientists uh, and invited you, if you remember, in the 2029 project, where the scientists who are dealing with all the uh, genomics and metabolomics, et cetera, and having this overwhelming amount of information said our only way to thrive and learn in this environment is to escalate up to knowledge. Mm -hmm. And so we were looking at the emergence of the knowledge technologies, the Watson, the natural language programs and ontologies. And the more I saw that potential, the more I became convinced that we have to go to the next level of wisdom in order to have a flourishing society. And so there's a wisdom of the ages that gets passed on as the sort of perennial wisdom. And then there's the new discovery of how that applies to our moment of societal development. And, and so I think beyond health and health care, there really is that what are the images of how we develop wisely on a planet that goes from seven to eight to nine billion people, uh, moving through technology generations that, you know, they move uh, with the life cycle of a fruit fly, uh, a lot of the technologies, while we're moving at a much slower. So how can we incorporate these in ways that shape a society that can flourish well beyond the people who are here now? That's fantastic. 
Uh, I have to ask you this question. How far uh, can certainly technology will be involved uh, in this movement from information to knowledge it already has and will still be around uh, if we transition over into wisdom? How far can technology assist us in that and when does it become a barrier? And how can we, can we balance that uh, so that uh, the core elements, the virtues, if you will, compassion, uh, and altruism uh, and uh, the aspirational components that so often come into the scenarios. How far uh, can we push those, and, and what's the role of technology in that? Well, I, I will say that technology has the capacity to dehumanize us or rehumanize us, and, and that I think wisdom is where we become more human. Uh, what I've seen uh, is that we get into fantasies of projection and we project onto technology at, at our risk. And when we do that with the greatest despair, those technologies that emerge and become most potent are those that are most destructive mm -hmm. to us. So the atomic bomb symbolizes, in effect, uh, if you think of the despair of World War I leading into World War II, all you have to read is The Wasteland, that T.S. Eliot uh, poem. And, and in, a, in a sense, uh, many of the people who said, well, God is dead, and we got the existential uh, dread and angst and fear. And it's expressed technologically in the annihilation of the nuclear bomb. I think the rehumanizing is where we actually uh, take our capacity, uh, let's take robotics, for example, um, and the marriage of robotics with neuroscience. Well, its forefront is beautifully applied to people who've had the worst traumas and are paralyzed and can no longer move. And then, thanks to an implanted chip, they're able to have a computer move for them soon prosthetics and so it's it's an expression of great humanity to take those who have been dealt with you know really a tough hand in life and that's why I would also contend that if we're going to be a society really shifting from pure medical over expenditure and into how do we improve the health of all oh, we're probably going to use our technologies to design optimal environments. And I know Samueli is doing optimal healing environments. And I would say that's pioneering in a way that also looks at uh, the capacity of people to flourish. And flourish means to develop successfully and quickly. And so our capacity to design environments for flourishing, uh, which on one level is healing, when somebody has had you know, the, the sadness of a you know, parent killed or tr early life trauma or what they call ACEs for uh, adverse childhood experiences, uh, that's the healing side of a, an environment for flourishing. I think we'll also be very, very clever at uh, saying, you know, human genetics can teach us how to create environments that create optimal gene expression for developing the very best human being. And this is not a human that's like a robot. It's not a Terminator or Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. This is much more a human who becomes more compassionate earlier. That's, that's fantastic. So technology and other tools are simply tools. Uh, and if we keep our eye on the future, a future of wisdom and compassion, then that's where that uh, will emerge. And from that, the consequences of healing and flourishing in those areas. So, uh, fantastic. Well, I want to I want to thank you, Jonathan. Uh, I think we're about at the end of uh, this conversation for now, uh, but this is an ongoing and continuing conversation. I'm sure we'll we'll have, and it's been a great pleasure to have work with you. And I look forward to working with you uh, more so in the future. Thank you, Wayne. The pleasure is certainly mine too. Okay. In a flourishing society, each individual will guide their own path from past to future. 
and thoughtful exploration of options, opportunities, and making informed choices. With thought leaders such as Jonathan Peck mapping these ideas, we will undoubtedly see transformations in the healthcare industry, shifting focus from merely the physical to an understanding of how the mind, body, and spirit are intertwined and support each other to heal the whole person. Thank you.